Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Holy One, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of God's robe filled the temple. Above were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Holy One. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the Creator, the Holy One. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Holy One saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Good morning. So this morning, uh, for children's time, the story will be told by my husband, Mike, and it was written by him as well. So I think you'll enjoy that. And I'll work some of the puppets. The sun was just going down, and many of the bugs were busy skimming over the water of the pond that lay almost at the edge of the dark forest. Mr. Toad was feeling lazy. Hey, he said to a nearby frog on a green, green lily pad. Could you chase a fly this direction? <laughs> you have all the flies over there, and I have none over here. The frog glanced the direction of Mr. Toad, but did not move. Hey, I'm talking here, said Mr. Toad. The frog slid off the pad and disappeared into a layer of green algae that hid him immediately. I hate it when they don't listen. Don't they know that when you're big, you're important? When you're important, you need other people to do things for you. Don't they know that? The frog three pads over stopped sunning and ducked away, disappearing. What's the use of being important if other people ignore you? The toad said to no one listening. <laughs> Who are you talking to? Who might, who might, who might that be? The frog looked to see who was speaking. But he saw no one. Did you hear me? The voice was small, highly pitched, and a little breathless. The frog glanced every direction but could find no one on the lily pads, no raccoon on the shore, no wide, no wide winged bird on a tree branch. Somebody playing a trick on me. Did the water snake hear me and duck away so I couldn't see him? Or maybe did the squirrel scurry off the limb after calling out and scratch his way down and away? <clears throat> Makes me feel silly talking to no one I can see. Who might, who might, who might that be? 
The same high-pitched voice was very near, but Toad saw no one. No one at all. He did hear a buzz behind him. Might a bee have a voice as big as the toad had heard? That didn't seem likely. By this time, the toad had forgotten that he was such a big frog. He had forgotten that he was now all alone on the pond. He had forgotten that all the flies had disappeared. He had not forgotten that he was hungry. So he tried an old trick. He sang the same tune repeatedly. A fly, a fly, a fly, want I. A fly, a fly, a fly, want I. Get it, get it, get it. <laughs> he stopped. The buzzing he had, he had heard before turned him. He finally saw the hummingbird hanging just above. Can I tell you what I see? said the bird. I see the squirrel scurry away. I see the snake hide in the reeds. I hear the deer raise their heads and walk away from the pond's edge. I hear no other sounds than the whirring of my wings and the throaty, tiresome call of you, <laughs> whining that you are hungry. Things do not revolve around you, Mr. Toad. I would have helped if you were nice. I say to you, goodbye. <laughs> Perhaps some other day I will help you out. Nice to others will foster nice to you, you know. Get it, get it, get it. <laughs> and all the other animals around the pond heard what the hummingbird said and saw no matter how repeated his orders, no matter how loudly he demanded, no matter how anything, they need not be servants to the toad. They never were again. And from that day, toads do not yell, no matter how large they are, you will not hear from them, get it. They're much more polite. In the evening, some of them even try to sing. <laughs> they've learned, you see. You might say, they've changed their tune. Being Memorial Day, this song's about a funeral. Um, I, where, I, uh, where I grew up in Portland, um, I, in high school I tried to be not home as much as humanly possible. And so I ate at my grandmother's a lot and I ate at um, my best friend's house. There were like five boys, you know, they were all, all of them but one were like six feet and up. And their dad used to eat cereal in a, in a mixing bowl. Um, and the youngest one's name was Eddie. And the last time I had seen Eddie before his funeral was when he was in high school. So it had been about 25 years, something like that. And I went to the funeral and they had put up all these pictures about, you know, about Eddie from his past and they were all laid out in the hall. And I walked down the hall and I knew every picture that was there. I was either in it or I was there when they took it. And that kind of shocked me. And then people who were there started to talk about Eddie. Now, Eddie and I would have agreed with absolutely, on absolutely nothing. He was right wing NRA, freedom, you know, all that, Second Amendment, all that stuff. But what, ha what kept happening was people would get up and say, yeah, I remember, you know, uh, that really cold winter we had and uh, our power was out and Eddie showed up with a truckload of wood. I don't know how he knew, but he showed up. 
Yeah, I remember when uh, I was back from the hospital and I was supposed to exercise to rehab. And one day Eddie shows up and says, hey, well, how about if I come and run with you three or four times a week? I wanted to get back into it anyway. And there's like a whole room full of people telling these stories. No matter what went on, you needed something, Eddie showed up. Nobody knows how he knew to show up. And this song is a, kind of about that. Eddie's trail Up behind the house it goes Back in the forest To a platform in the trees We all went there Side by side and all alone And we had a moment When we felt that you were there Pictures on the wall I recognize them all The gifted child I knew the best Than when you'd grown strong and tall It is trail, an oasis in a wilderness of asphalt and concrete and hearts made out of stone. It is trail, where does it really go? Maybe it's a pilgrimage to a place that we call home. As I stood there, the world around me disappeared And every moment that we ever shared came drawing near Pictures on the wall, I hear them call Nostalgic dreams where it still seems that we were one for all It is trail, an oasis in a wilderness of asphalt and concrete and hearts made out of stone. It is trail, a path he made for me and you, reminds us that the world we have comes from what we do. When we walk there, the mighty things all wash away. It's one to one when things are done that make the dreams come true. Pictures on the wall, it seems they never fall. Burn with pain inside my brain, they lead me down the hall. It is trail, an oasis in a wilderness of asphalt and concrete and hearts made out of stone. It is trail, an oasis in a wilderness of asphalt and concrete and hearts made out of stone. It is true. Dear Holy One, who you are beyond our understanding, our ability to comprehend, you're a mystery, you baffle us. <clears throat> it's my prayer that in these moments you would open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, as you did for Isaiah in the text Mike read to us, that we would see reality and that we would live connected, robust lives working for justice, equity, and fairness for all. Oh God, help us, we ask. Wake us up, we pray. 
In the name of Jesus. Amen. The text this morning comes to us uh, out of our lectionary, which is a, it's a series of readings that the people in charge of many Christian denominations choose and select to be read each Sunday. So this is the uh, out of those readings. This is one that is assigned for this Sunday. And I have to say, it is one of my favorite texts. I absolutely love Isaiah chapter 6. Theologians refer to this as the call of Isaiah, his call to become a prophet. He was of the priestly family uh, when he had this experience in the year that King Uzziah died. He saw God. Oh, and it shook him to the core blew his mind. Isaiah saw the Holy One. And what I've given my thoughts to this week in prayer in uh, preparation for this reflection on these words is I thought about what is the difference between true prophets and false prophets because as the texts are given to us, Isaiah is considered one of the true, true prophets. And we are in need of prophets in these days of troubled times with all the craziness going on in the world, in our country, in our community. We need voices to bring us uh, wisdom on how to live and how to behave. And so there are many voices clamoring for our attention. I don't know if your news feeds on your computer or like mine or your emails that come flooding into your inbox are like mine. But there are many would-be prophets out there saying, listen to me, follow me, this is what we need to do. And how do we separate the true from the false? And this text for me is an opportunity to consider how we might do that. So I would suggest Isaiah is a true prophet and some of the marks of a true prophet. In his call, First of all, he has an upward vision. He sees the Holy One and it shakes him to the core. He sees God in glorious splendor and it is awesome and overwhelming what he sees. So he has an upward vision which leads to an inward vision. After seeing the Holy One, he sees in himself his ego, his pride, his arrogance. And he goes, oh, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I am a selfish, priggish little snob. Oh, deliver me from this. And that leads to an outward vision. Once he is broken of his selfish, egoish, egoic nature by this vision of God. And, and God says, who will go for us? Who will be our voice? And Isaiah humbly and meekly says, Here am I, send me. So he has an upward vision that leads to an inward vision that leads to an outward vision. To me, those are the marks of an authentic prophet. And there are some other things I, I considered this week in thinking about authentic prophets from false prophets. And, and let me try and describe false prophets for you for a moment. In uh, the book of Jeremiah, another true prophet, God is decrying the rise of false prophets. And here was the scenario that's going on in Jeremiah chapter 14. The nation of Israel is surrounded by enemies that are about to conquer them and make them slaves and deport them. And the false prophets rise up and say, don't be afraid. God is with us. God will protect us. You don't need to fear the size of the enemy's army. We will be rescued by our God. Trust in God. And I want to remind you, they were the false prophets. The true prophet, Jeremiah, is saying, you can do whatever you want. We're going to be conquered and deported. We're, it's already done. And 
the people liked what the false prophets were saying more than what Jeremiah was saying. And so then God speaks through Jeremiah about the false prophets in chapter 14 of the book of Jeremiah. Verse 14, it says this. The Holy One said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name, these false prophets. And God says this, I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and delusions of their own minds. God says, I have not appointed them sent them, or spoken to them. That's why they are false prophets. They're speaking out of their own ego, their own desire. And so I've thought a lot this week about among us, the false prophets and the true prophets, because here's the difficulty. All prophets, true and false, use the same mantra. They use the same speech. We are going to speak truth to power. That's what we're doing. We're speaking truth to power. And there are any number of voices in our culture, in, in our country, crying out, we are speaking truth to power. Well, how do you separate the true from the false when they're saying the same things? And I would suggest, here's a couple of ideas that I use to separate true from false prophets. I look for these markers. Authentic prophets, as I read them in the Bible at any rate, none of them wanted to be prophets. One of the real signs of a true prophet is they didn't want to be one. When God came to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and said, you're going to be my prophet, I'm going to send Moses five times. And Exodus chapter 3 tries to talk God out of it. I, no, you don't want me. No, no. I'm not a good speaker, not a good public speaker. Go get somebody else. Go bother somebody else. I'm happy taking care of my stepfather's sheep out here in Midian. Just leave me alone. Leave me alone. And God would not leave Moses alone. When Jonah was called to be a prophet, he got on a boat going the other way. I'm not going there. No way. Elijah went and hid in a cave. Leave me alone. And God wouldn't leave him alone. said, what are you doing here? I mean, the, Jeremiah, who I've quoted to you, when God came to call him to be a prophet, said, no, 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 I'm too young. Go get sick. Go bother somebody else. Let me be a kid. I just want to grow up. God wouldn't leave him alone. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before the great prophetic act of the crucifixion. I don't want to do this, but not my will. I'll do what you want. Prophets don't want to be prophets. In our day, I, I, an authentic prophet, I trust the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Have you read his speech, A Knock at Midnight? He just wanted to leave me alone. God, leave me alone. I just want to be a good dad. I want to be a good husband. Let me pastor this little church in Montgomery. Leave me alone. And God would not leave Martin Luther King Jr. alone. And we have been the beneficiaries of true prophets. So one of the markers I look for is in a real prophet, they don't want to be one. Another thing I see in true prophets, they are broken, not broke. They have a humility. They have been undone as Isaiah was. Woe is me. They realize we're all part of the same stuff. They're not better than anybody else. That's another sign I look for in a true prophet. And we need the voice of prophets to help us navigate the world you and I live in, which is, you know, it's a mess. And so how do we do this? Well, this week I've been teaching a class up at SOU for the students on uh, a philosophy class on death and dying, what the philosophers have to say. And recently we've been studying 
the wisdom of Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche has this great line. I, I, this is one of Nietzsche. Nietzsche's got a bunch of great lines. But this is, this is a good one. This is on a t-shirt somewhere. He says, They who fight with monsters should look to it that they themselves do not become monsters. For when you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss gazes back at you. And what Nietzsche is saying is, if our efforts to work for justice and equity, we become just as mean and nasty and oppressive as the oppressors, there's no difference. If, if our efforts to work for justice and acceptance we're just as mean as the oppressors. That's not helpful. We've become the monsters we're fighting against. And so how do we separate being false prophets and, and, and being true prophets to, to what's going on? Well, I know the word false prophet can sound incredibly negative. The word false sort of does that for it. So I... The way I've reframed it in my own mind, I think of, of zealots. I, I would think of false prophets as zealots, people that are filled with zeal out of their own egoic nature to try to be self-appointed and self-promoting and trying to gather a following and gather a crowd. Come on, let's go speak truth to power out of their own ego. Uh, for me, that's zealotry. And I've compared being a zealot to a, to a true prophet. And here's what I've been thinking about. And I share this humbly with you this morning. Zealots aim to confront rebellious souls while prophets work to emancipate wounded spirits. Zealots want to clean you up. And prophets invite you to get your hands dirty. Zealots defined ideological beliefs and prophets work to tear down false concepts. Zealots want to change your mind and prophets want to pierce your heart. Zealots want to define God for you and prophets help you embrace the enigma that is God. Zealots want you to share their answers. And prophets want you to share in the mystery. With zealots, you celebrate the rightness of your position. And with prophets, you embrace your failures. Zealots focus on condemnation, while prophets focus on acceptance. Zealots are all about the destination. Well, prophets are all about the journey. Zealots take, help us to take pride in what we see, how clearly we see. Prophets expose how blind we all are. Zealots seek to tame the beast, while prophets work to liberate the beauty. Zealots uphold the rule of law, while prophets default to the rule of love. Zealots promise wisdom, and prophets guarantee paradox. Zealots are consumed with doctrine, while prophets wrestle with doubt. Zealots urge you to fight for your rights, and prophets help you to forgive for being wronged. Zealots work to separate you from sinners, while prophets help you connect with others. Zealots intimidate through fear, while prophets invite the fearful to freedom. Zealots emphasize the power of truth, while prophets emphasize the necessity of trust. 
Zealots will help you erect differences, while prophets help you tear down walls. Zealots will put you in your place with nails if necessary, and prophets will bring you back to life. Zealots work to touch the heart of God's people, while prophets work to touch the heart of God. Now I share this with you, and I stand before you and confess I am a recovering zealot. And I have seen firsthand the danger and the damage that zealots can do to other human beings. And, and look, I, I've been in the religion game long enough to know we're all a mixture. None of us is pure. But it would be my encouragement this morning that we work to become true prophets, that we stare down the zealots that live in our breasts and tell them to sit down and be quiet as we try to hear the voice of the true living one that shook Isaiah all those years ago and helped him to engage life as a true prophet, a liberator of one who spoke and did and enacted compassion and truth and reconciliation. May it be so.